tonight on this edition of John Ankerberg, is astrology a true or false practice? This is an important question since 40 million Americans believe in some form of astrology and over 1 billion people in the world look to astrology for help in guiding their lives. Recently, it was learned that astrology has influenced even the highest levels of our national government, the White House. And as you will hear, also influences our industry, the sciences, education, the church, and the home. All right. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cultish entering the Kingdom of the Cults. My name is Jeremiah Roberts. I'm one of the co-hosts here. I'm here, as always, with Andrew Super Sleuth, Andrew, the Super Sleuth of the show. How are you doing, man? I'm ecstatic, man. I've... I, we got one of our favorite guests on. It's Marsha Montenegro. And, I mean, how can you not be excited? We went over the Enneagram last time with her, and it was in super extreme excited. detail. But now we have her back. Yes. Yeah, it's good to have you back. Marsha, how are you? Oh, I'm doing fine. Thank you guys so much for having me back and for um, saying I'm one of your favorite guests. That's really quite an honor. So um, I'm really happy to be here again. Uh, excellent. And so in many ways, uh, we're excited to have you on because last time we it was the end of last year and we had an in-depth conversation about the Enneagram and that rattled the cages a little bit and the Internet and them, them as Jeff would say, uh, them, them, internets. them Internets. And so but it was really cool. You know, we had people that listened in and, and looked at the facts uh, of what we presented there. And there were people even who were uh, teachers of mm-hmm. the Enneagram in churches yeah. and they realized that they just, they repented of it and they realized this is something I cannot do if I'm a Christian. Yeah. And so if you're wondering what that's all about, if you're new to the podcast, uh, go to one of our earlier episodes, decoding the Enneagram and check that out. So Marsha, it's always a pleasure to have you on. And in many ways, because astrology, that's your forefront. That's your area of expertise and, and even a lot more than you'd say the Enneagram. In many ways, what we want to do is um, we want to give you unprecedented permission to just show this for what it is. And in many ways, we're, we want to uh, release the crack. And so on that note, we got to play this little clip here. Release the Kraken. Yes, that's the, <laughs> that's our nickname for you, Marsha Montenegro. Yes. You're the Kraken. Thank you. Yes, Thank so you. we're here. Yeah, so we're here to talk about astrology. We're here. We want to release the Kraken. Yes. Uh, on everything regarding that, because this is honestly one of those things that it, the New Age is so inundated with our society on every aspect, whether it's yeah. uh, physical fitness, whether it's. Uh, Whole Foods, both either the uh, the actual facility, the actual uh, store, or even really just organic. marriage yeah, relationships. The, every aspect, it's all over the place. So in many ways, unexpectedly, the uh, the aspects of astrology may will will sneak in there. And in many ways, the clip that we played at the beginning of the show that was from the John Ankerberg show, kind of talking about during his time during the eighties, where even Ronald Reagan. The pres the president Ronald Reagan, you know, they he had an astrologer. His wife, yeah, his, yeah, his wife had an astrologer, and mm-hmm. yeah, so a lot of big fascination back then, and even more so now, given where we are. So, uh, Marcia, if you could uh, tell everyone just a little about your story, how you got into astrology, because while this really was your area of expertise, and you even went through a, a certification that you can talk about, that really people had to go through the where you were living at the time that you kind of had a journey that led you to getting interest into astrology. Can you share that with the audience just so people can kind of know about your experience and kind of your, what makes you uh, an expertise on the subject at hand of astrology that we're going to discuss? Yeah, um, sure. Uh, I had an interest in astrology um, in high school. And um, I just, I don't know why, I can't remember exactly when it started, but I know I had a very strong interest in it. I read the horoscope columns in the paper by Jean Dixon, who was very popular at the time, although she was a psychic and not an astrologer. And I continued to have that interest in college, and people would ask me about zodiac signs. Um, I didn't know a whole lot, but I knew a little bit more than other people. Uh, And so after college, I had already been interested in the supernatural and Eastern religions. Also, uh, well, I got interested in Eastern religions in college. I had been interested in the supernatural a little bit in high school. 
But my interest in those two areas continued after college, and I was um, seeking things. I was interested in contact with the dead. I was reading um, books. Um, I went to psychics. I went to an astrologer. And then um, I decided that I wanted to uh, learn something that I could use, you know, because at this point I was like a student who was reading and listening to other people. And I wanted to be able to learn something that I could actually do on my own. So that was sort of my motivation. And astrology is what really had fascinated me and was the only thing that I wanted to actually learn, you know, really take the time to understand, even though I, I honestly didn't really know that much about what was involved. Um, so I did start taking some um, astrology classes and uh, they were offered um, at this place um, in Atlanta. And I, when I realized what I realized at the beginning, it was kind of a rude awakening um, that it, at first it's all math. You have to learn all these formulas to calculate the chart. <laughs> and that was really, really scary because I'm terrible at math. So <laughs> uh, initially I thought, oh, no, I, I don't know if I can do this. You know, I was really kind of afraid. And I thought maybe this is a big mistake. You know, I don't I don't want to do any math. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that you have to. Um, so I just kind of, you know, forced myself to to stick with it. And I learned it, and then you get into the interpretation, and I was, uh, you know, just learning from the in the class, and in it in Atlanta, which is where I was living at mm -hmm. the time. It's where I went after college. They had a very unusual um, setup, and the setup was that in order to practice legally in the city limits, you had to have a business license. But in order to qualify to purchase the business license, you had to show that you had passed an exam that proved you knew astrology. Hmm. And the reason they had this like this is because years before, uh, astrology, practicing astrology was illegal right. in the city limits. And, and this is true in a lot of cities. Uh, it's usually it's classified under fortune telling and a lot of cities have have laws or ordinances on the books that fortune telling is illegal. Um, they're not always enforced, but they're on the books. And so um, the astrologers in Atlanta, um, one in particular, wanted to change this and went to one of the city council people and said, um, you know, look, there are serious people who do astrology. We're not fortune tellers. We're not like con artists. We really know our stuff. And what we should do is just make sure people who say they're astrologers really know astrology. And so what they decided to do was um, make it so that you would have a business license, but you'd have to qualify. Hmm. And the way you qualified was you, you took the test given by the American Federation of Astrologers, which is a national test given in different cities at different times of the years. And that's very hard to do because you often have to travel to another city if they're not going to come to your city. And so uh, the Atlanta astrologers and I guess the city council decided they could set up their own board that would do the exams, you know, and, and certify people. So people wouldn't have to do the American Federation of Astrologers exam. So that's what they did. So basically, they set up an exam and you would sign up for it and you would take it. You would go to City Hall. I went to City Hall and I took the test in City Hall. <laughs> and um, then the exams are mailed to the board of astrology examiners who grade the exam. And then they tell the city council who passed and who didn't. And then the city, uh, not the city council, but the city officials. And then the city sends letters to the people who took the exam. So it's this very formal process that you know you have to you have to go through if you want to be qualified to purchase the license which I wanted to do I wanted to you know I wanted to have the license and I wanted to show that I really could pass the test the test was seven hours long wow yeah 
It's, wow. it's, it was not, basically it was all day, you know, and it was an hour for lunch and at lunch, everyone had to go together to the same place for lunch. Hmm. And we all had to eat together because you couldn't have, you know, you couldn't have it where someone could go off somewhere and get an answer from somebody or something like that, you know, call somebody up. <laughs> hmm. So you, they had it, it was very strict. So I remember us all walking over and, to, you know, to this cafeteria to have lunch uh, there near City Hall, there was a cafeteria for the state workers and the city workers. And then, you know, we all walked back, you know, after lunch. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. And everybody's in the room, you know, and, and there's a monitor. There's one of the people from the astrology board is there in the room. Um, the first part of the exam is all mathematical. You're given a set of, you're giving a data, birth data. So it could be, let's just say, it's uh, May 21st, um, 1969, um, you know, whatever, Chicago, Illinois. Mm -hmm. So you're given that data and you have to know the math to take that data and compute the chart. You couldn't use a cal We didn't, weren't even allowed to have calculators. So you had oh, to wow. do all of the, oh, you had to know the formulas and you had to do them by hand. Hmm. It's, it's kind of time consuming. And you have to interpolate the cusp of the houses, which is this mathematical procedure. What you're doing is you're taking the time and you do have two books there. There's a book that shows you the position of the planets at um, either midnight or noon, Greenwich time, and all astrologers have to use that. And then there's a book called The Table of Houses, which is how you calculate the 12 houses that are in the chart. You know, it's the chart is a circle uh -huh. and it's divided into 12 parts. So all of that's calculated based on the time and date of birth. Right. So you have to figure out the local time because the, the standard time zones that we have are not exact times. You know, you can say, OK, I was born at 3.30 a.m., you know, in um, Jacksonville, Florida, uh, and somebody else in the Eastern time zone, uh, maybe a hundred miles West was maybe born at three thirty AM, but actually because they're a hundred miles West of that, it's not going to be exactly the same. Cause that's the local time is different. Right. The local time is the exact time. Of course we don't use that cause it would be very awkward. Everybody would be on different, time, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. if people think the time zones are bad, you know, just try living by local time. <laughs> Wow. So um, you have to figure out the exact time and then you do the chart based on that. So it's all this mathematical stuff. And that was the first part of the exam. And that really took, you know, a good for me, it took a good half day. It took mm -hmm. me half of time to do that. The second part, when you're finished that, they give you a chart. It's it's a real chart of a real person. They don't tell you who it is. Um, and you have to take that chart and you write out an interpretation of it as though you were talking to the person. Hmm. Hmm. So it's a test to see, first of all, your skill in interpreting the chart and then your skill in talking to somebody about it. So, um, you know, they're testing that, too, so right. that you have some kind of uh, conscience of, of, or some kind of sensitivity to the person you're talking to. And you, you wouldn't say something like really startling or, or horrible to them. So that was, that, was, that was it. And, I mean, I used every minute of those seven hours. I needed every minute. I think I was, you know, there just, you know, finishing, like, mm. when there was, like, one minute left or something. Yeah. And um, most people were. Mm -hmm. There's only a handful of yeah. us. There was only a handful of us mm -hmm. uh, taking it. And then, uh, you know, the tests are gathered up by the astrologer who who sends them or takes them to the per, the office in the city council. And um, let's see. And I can't remember exactly how. No, no. I guess they take the test. Oh, I forgot to tell you. You're assigned a number. When you sign up for the test, the city assigns a number to you. And when you do the test, you don't put your name on the uh, test you put your number mm. so that way the astrologers grading the exam don't know who the people are gotcha hmm. so they're not biased so you know you could be number 37 or whatever and they don't know you know because in most cases the astrologers are going to know some of the people taking the test mm -hmm. so um, in order to keep that bias away they do it by number 
And then the astrologers, you know, meet. I was on the astrology board later. I was on it for four years and I was chairperson for the last three of those four years. And we would meet and we would, um, you know, go over the tests. Um, I can't remember if we divided them up and went over it or if we got together. I can't remember now. But then we would discuss it. And, you know, if anybody was clearly failing, we would have to fail them. If we, if it was borderline, we would discuss it, et cetera. And then we would tell the city, you know, number 39 and 37 failed and number 42 and 28 and 79 or whatever, they all passed. And then the city sends letters out to those people because they know the numbers. They know the names for mm. the numbers. Yeah. So in summary, then you, you did, there's a lot of work you had to, to put in this. And at least, I'm sure yes. at the time when you found out that you passed is probably a little bit of a breath of relief at the time. It's almost any time you have to take some sort of extravagant test. You know, I think about yes, all the time yes. when I was in high school or college, you know, right. you have to cram yeah. last minute. I kind of feel like that sometimes with episodes, just this last minute cram and like, ah, yeah. I hope that episode's good, you know, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> But yeah, so in many ways, would so would you sum up just real quickly the the Cliff Notes Wikipedia summary, or in this case, your your summary of astrology is that it's really it's based they base it off of when you're born. It's when you're born, where the universe is at, how the universe is aligned, and what the stars and planets basically say about you and your identity. That's that's what it is in summary. There's a lot of different aspects depending on the culture and everything else. Would that be an accurate assessment? A very cliff notes version. I would I would say yes. I would say it's the um, it's it's the position of the sun, moon, and planets um, based on the time and place of birth. Mm. Okay. And so that's how I that's a simple a basic definition. And I just want to say that um, because sometimes people are very confused because they get astronomy and astrology mixed up. Right. So I want to say that it's astrology and astronomy are not the same thing. And astronomy is a scientific study of, of space and the heavenly bodies. So they're looking at physical data. Mm -hmm. You know, they're looking at physical data. Astrology looks at some of that physical data, but also gives gives a meaning to it. Right. Yes. So, and you, you know, it's very, it's com completely different. And sometimes people, I don't know, they I guess because the words are similar, they get yeah. them mixed up. And also in ancient times, they were the same thing. Yeah, that's what I was, I was thinking in the terms of the test itself to legitimize the practice. I mean, we can see mathematics is brought into it, that you yeah. need to go to City Hall. I find that very interesting, right? Like there's a, a pseudoscience in the sense of mm -hmm. bringing meaning and presuppositions to mathematics in the form of measuring stars and data from where you're born, talking about mm -hmm. how a person's going to live. But it's legitimatized, trying to make legal the United States system, not by pointing to the ulterior motives of astrology, but by trying to say that it's an actual science. Well, yeah, astrologers would probably um, say that. Now, the city in allowing this to happen, of course, was going to benefit because people would have to purchase a business license every year. Ah, and, yes. And the, and, the biz, and the business license at that time was $100 a year, which, okay. which is a lot of money and for a lot of people mm -hmm. <laughs> like me. And so um, I think that I, I don't know because I wasn't there when all this was decided, but my guess is that the city saw this as, as a, an advantage and that was one reason that they, and they also thought, okay, yeah, this is one way we can also find people who say they're doing astrology mm. and they haven't, they don't have the license, we can find them, Right. you know, and so they would have a reason to go after people who had not taken the test and purchased mm. the license. So that way they could re more or less regulate it in the city. By doing this, it doesn't mean that the city was saying astrology was legitimate. Okay. And this is an important point because there's a lot of people who will say they are certified such and such. I'm a certified, um, you know, um, massage therapist or I'm a certified, uh, I don't know, I can't think of different things. Sound therapist, Anything. hypnotherapist. You could even yeah. be a certified sound therapist, yeah. And it all it means usually is that you have been certified by people in that field who have tested you according to the standards of that field. Hmm. Maybe it's run by a bureaucratic process like like what I just described but that doesn't mean that the bureaucracy behind it is saying it's legitimate they're just saying yes 
this person passed an exam that was given by people in that field to test the knowledge. And according to the people in that particular field, this person has the knowledge. Right. And that's all it's saying. So being certified in something doesn't make the field you're certified in legitimate. I think it's good for the listeners to know that because I feel like there could be a level of undue influence and trust when someone goes to someone who is an astrologer. They can say, well, I've got my certification in astrology. Yes. They may think that they're actually doing yes. something that's legitimate. But we also have yes. uh, here, too, a clip we want to play from uh, Walter Martin, and this is him defining a. Uh, Astrology. Yeah, because I want to. So this is a good clip because what we want to do after this is that we we kind of because you mentioned about the differentiation between astrology and astronomy, but that's part and parcel to uh, the history and origins of astrology. And so mm -hmm. I want to play this clip from Walter Martin. I definitely want to delve into that because within the history, uh, from the history of astrology, come a lot of the terminology that we want to get into. And one of the things that Walter Martin was fantastic with doing during his ministry is that he would always define terms. So mm -hmm. a lot of the words you hear that we'll mention, you've probably have heard them either in movies, uh, just in every uh, movies, uh, music, uh, different, like I said, all the different aspects of health, food, nutrition. You probably have heard a lot of these uh, personal development the personal development industry, Tony Robbins like material. It's all over the place. It's mm -hmm. every it's everywhere. And so mm -hmm. what we're gonna do is we're gonna play this clip from Walter Martin and then we're gonna we're gonna jump into Yes. We're gonna release the we're gonna release the Kraken right after yes. this. Yes. <laughs> all right. Here we go. Here we, Here go. we go. Here's Uncle Wally. I would have to say that my reservations about astrology are based upon its origins, its association with polytheism, and the fact that what you're really getting is an analysis of the characteristics of the gods when they are discussing the various signs of the zodiac. This can easily be demonstrated, has been for a number of years. Uh, actually, the uh, Oxford English Dictionary gives an excellent definition of this. It says that astrology is the art of judging the occult influences of the stars upon uh, human affairs. And uh, this is where astrology has always been coming from as far as the Christian church is concerned and Judaism is concerned. Uh, there's nothing to be said good about astrology in the Old Testament that's connected with polytheism and paganism. And I think if we're going to deal with it honestly from a Judeo-Christian perspective, uh, and this is a country which espouses that perspective, the United States, then uh, I think it'd be a good idea for Western civilization to take a good look at the origin of it and not be misled by the fact that scientific information and other things are brought in and attempt to establish it. Biblically speaking, it's not compatible with Christianity. All right. So, and again, that's very relevant today. I don't know how much the uh, United States would identify too much as a Christian nation as when Walter Martin was around. Right. Uh, that has definitely changed a little bit, but it still is incredibly relevant because the more secularized a culture becomes, uh, the vacuum for things like astrology and other practices become mm -hmm. very uh, relevant. So going to the historical origins, you know, we have with us, if you guys are watching this uh, behind my giant uh, vat of water, uh, this is a book, Kingdom of the Occult by uh, Dr. It's an accumulation of his teachings that uh, Jill, uh, his daughter, uh, Jill Martin, helped uh, put together. And in chapter eight, his section of astrology, he goes into the origins and there's what I'm just, I just want to give the floor to you because in many ways, uh, the his, the history of astrology, it's, what, it's one thing biblically but it's been carried out differently throughout different cultures. So he mentions uh, there's areas in which astrology grew in Mesopotamia, uh, Europe, Africa, India, and China. But can you just sh share with us just a little bit about what you know about the historical origins of astrology, where it came from, and also how it relates to the different cultures and how they carried out astrology? Um, yes. Um, yes, I can tell you some of that. Um, is that the book you said that's the Kingdom of the Occult? Yes, by Dr. Walter yeah. Martin. Yeah, that that his daughter Jill Rishi put together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, at the end of that chapter in Astrology is my testimony. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I read that the other day. I, I, yeah, I, I was thinking, in the, at least in the original edition of that. Um, yeah, because I, I have read over that chapter. Um, yes, now, the origin of it, exactly how it started nobody really knows because when you go back into those ancient times they didn't really they either didn't keep a record of everything they were doing or we don't have the records so we don't really know exactly how it came about but the way it was practiced in the ancient world was different it was it was done only for rulers you know rulers and kings and it was done 
um, mainly to give advice to the king about, you know, when his enemies might attack or maybe a good time for him to make peace with another, you know, ruler or something like that. So it wasn't done on this individual kind of basis the way we see it today. And it was just done for rulers. Um, you know, we see that in the book of Daniel right. when the king wanted his um, wise men, which included the astrologers, to interpret his dream. So, of course, wise men were did did more than just one thing. So they interpreted dreams. They knew astrology, you know, and they probably did other things as well. And um, so he was he was the king, and so he had these people. So regular ordinary citizens didn't have couldn't go to an astrologer, <laughs> and they didn't and they didn't look at the individual person like that we do today. So that was how it was in the ancient world. And it's almost more like looking at the um, position of planets as omens. And of course, they didn't know those were planets because the concept of planet didn't exist then. Mm. So they just saw these heavenly bodies and noticed they moved faster than the stars. Because if you compare the way, you know, Venus and Mars move to the stars, like real stars way up there, they're, they're moving like 10 times faster, you know, <laughs> like the star doesn't move all that much. But here's this planet, Mars goes around the Earth every two years, you know, and Venus goes around faster, and Mercury's even faster. Um, so, uh, and then as you go outward, of course, they're slower, and they could only see up through to Saturn. They did not know about Neptune, Uranus, or Pluto at that time. Mm -hmm. So the Saturn was the limit. Um, and actually, that's what Saturn stands for in astrology. It stands for limitations hmm. and structure. And it's probably because it was, for a long time, the outermost planet until um, Uranus was discovered in the 18th century. Hmm. So, um, you know, until that time, they didn't know about those three outer planets. And, and so it was used that way until it got to Greece and it got into Greece in the later, later part of Greece when Greece was beginning to sort of disintegrate and being influenced by other cultures, including the um, Arabic culture. And what I read is that astrology came into Greece from the Arab, from the Arabs. Hmm. And um, they started they started adopting astrology. And it was the Greeks who first used it for individuals. And this was just done by the wealthier families who could afford someone to pay someone who knew astrology. And they would usually do it for like the birth of a child. So they would want to know the destiny of their child. Mm -hmm. And so it was done. Now, how they interpreted it, you know, it's it was it was not exactly the same as today. But I, I'm going to explain that. So but it's there you have the individual and horoscope is from the Greek that means watcher of the hour. Hmm. So it comes from the, the two words, um, which I don't know. I can't remember the Greek words, but it's like yeah. Hor Horus and Scopia or something, which means watcher. So it's looking at the hour of the birth, and that's where horoscope comes from. And that's that's so that's when it started becoming individual. Now, meanwhile, in, in other places like China, um, astrology was complete is a completely different system, and I don't know how it got started in China. Um, I don't know anything about the history of it, but I know astrology in China is like a completely different system. They use these different animals each year is um, uh, tied to a different animal, and then different hours are tied, I think, to a different animal. And then you look, you do it completely differently. You don't do astrology. Chinese astrology the way you do Western astrology. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a totally different system. The astrology in India is somewhat like the astrology done in the in what I would say the West, which and by West I mean Europe and the United States mainly. And it's similar to India, but India has slightly different ways of interpreting things and um, calculating the chart isn't exactly the same. So there are some differences, but they're more like us than China is. Mm -hmm. And then Native Americans have their own form of astrology that's completely different and has nothing to do with Western astrology. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I had a book that was kind of a Native American astrology book that I used to kind of look at. I wasn't trying to learn it, but I was just curious. And, yeah, it was completely different. So oh. there are different 
systems. And, you know, they're all kind of using nature to get information from. And astrology um, did start, just like all the occult practices were connected with the worship of false gods. Hmm. Because it's a form of divination. Right. So divination is reading a hidden meaning into something natural that that doesn't have that meaning. You know, it doesn't have an obvious meaning, just like palm reading. When you look at your hand, you see these lines on your hand, but they don't mean anything. They're just lines on your hand. And if you want them to mean something, you have to give them a meaning. You have to read a meaning into them. So that's divination. And also, or it can be using a supernatural power to access information. So that's what div divination is a huge category and covers a lot of different practices. But astrology falls under that practice. And the reason it's good to know that is because there is no Hebrew word for astrology. Gotcha. Which, which, so, make, which makes sense too. like kind of thinking about it biblically. Uh, I think like origins in terms of astrology, we can think about the pre-flood prior to the flood of Noah, right? And the world being very wicked at that time. I could see us in a sense of worshiping the creation or maybe even rulers trying to get information through astrologers. And then even the post-flood world after um, Noah and his sons, and then we have uh, Nimrod in the Tower of Babel from there. I can see how, you know, people would take some of these practices and go throughout the world after they're scattered and adapt them and adopt them in different ways. But so you're saying essentially the origination that we can see historically is that astrology was first used by rulers and then the Greeks adapted yes, and, and, it. Into... And I would say Babylon specifically. I don't right. know if it existed at the time of Nimrod or before the flood. I wouldn't speculate as to that because there's no evidence for that. I think that um, a lot of things are ascribed to Nimrod that shouldn't be. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> there's, very, mm -hmm. there's very little about him in the Bible. I mean, See, that's good. There's very little about him. And there's too much speculation with Nimrod that goes into all kinds of crazy stuff right. that I'm always denouncing on my Facebook page. <laughs> Perfect. So that... Maybe I'm not always denouncing it, but yeah. I have to denounce it. So I would say, you know, what we know of astrology is that it was with the Babylonians. And, that, and in fact, in Daniel, sometimes the term... Chaldeans actually means the astrologers. Ah. So um, that it's it's like an equiv equivocal word, and um, and we know that it was practiced there. We know it was, and in fact, Isaiah forty seven mm -hmm. is a judgment on Babylon, and part of the judgment, uh, if you read that, it's not a real long chapter. I think there's only like fifteen verses. Um, the judgment is denouncing their occult practices and yeah. astrology is mentioned towards the end. And so I wanted to explain that because I, when I said there's no Hebrew word for astrology, I figured some people hearing this are going to think, but I've read it in the Bible. I've read it in the old Testament. I've read the word astrology. And so I want to, I want to say that the reason you can put the English word astrology there, even though there's no Hebrew term for it is because Hebrew, the Hebrew um, language describe the practice of astrology differently. They didn't have that word because it's a modern word, but they described it differently. They described it as dividing up the heavens or doing prognostication by the stars mm -hmm. um, or maybe even bowing down to the stars. So they described what astrology was at that time with different words. And then when it's translated into English, or probably any other language like French, German, or whatever, they'll use the current word for astrology. Mm. Um, so I just I think it, I think it's important to explain that because that can be confusing. You know that could be confusing. Yeah. Um, so it's it's important to know God does denounce it, even though the uh, there's no Hebrew equivalent for the word astrology. That's good. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Marsha. So, um, yeah. So anyway, that's. I, so I haven't gotten through the history yet. You are. <laughs> no, no, that's good. But no, I want to I want to say something real quick that um, okay. I'm, I'm glad that you did bring that up with uh, Nimrod as well, because it does. It, it, it's good to keep us level headed, even in terms of mm -hmm. correction, because like you said, there is a lot of crazy rabbit holes you can go down. And that's mm -hmm. perfect. And I actually have Isaiah 47, 13 through 14 pulled up. I already had it pulled up. So I just want to read what it says real quick. Oh, okay. It says okay. You, you are wearied with your many counsels. Let them stand forth and save you. Those who divide the heavens, who gaze at the stars, who at the new moons make known what shall come upon you. Behold, they are like stubble. The fire consumes them. They cannot deliver themselves from the power of the flame. 
no coal for warming oneself is this, no fire to sit before. So not even the astrologers, in a sense, can save you from the wrath of God. Right. What what tra- what translation, what version was that? That, you read was, from? that was the ESV. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was good. I like that. I like the way they translated that because other other if you read other versions, it'll just say astrologers. Mm. But they said the divide up the heavens there. So I thought that was good because that was one of the terms in Hebrew that refers to astrologers. Hmm. Um, so yeah, so yeah, there, that's, that's, a, that's a verse I often point people to among other things when, um, people want to know where, what does God say about astrology? Does he say anything in the Bible about it? And he does. And, um, so that's one of the good passages to know about. And so the, so astrology was for a long time, you know, then it became for rich people in Greece and then it gradually spread. And we know it, of course, we know it got into Europe and was very um, used quite a bit. Actually, in Europe, it was used uh, for medical diagnoses. And they used to um, use astrology to diagnose you medically because they would determine uh, your illness um, based on your, you know, your your astrology chart. Uh, or what, how you should be treated, you know, I don't know the specifics, but I know that astrology was used in some ways. And of course, that's not a legitimate way to use, it's not a good way to, to decide how to treat somebody. But this is before, you know, this is like in the medieval period when they didn't, they didn't have the scientific understanding of, of germs and illness and how to treat things. And of course, they didn't have a lot of uh, good medicines, you know, this is when they like put leeches on you to bleed you and things like that. So, um, so astrology was very much a part of this kind of, um, non-scientific superstitious worldview. Yeah. And, um, probably, you know, I'm not an expert on the history, but I, I think that it was probably accepted by a lot of Christians at the time because it was part of the worldview. You know, they they considered it to be a valid way to look at things. So that was um, along with a lot of other things that were not valid, you know, but at that time were taken to be valid. So it was it was, you know, astrology's never gone away. It's just always been with us. And and then it develops, though, over time. Then you have the um, what they call the Age of Enlightenment. And when you have uh, what's the sciences start to become, uh, start to develop. And this is when astronomy and astrology split. So astronomy, which became, start, started to become, have more um, discovery and data about it and develop as a science, you know, no longer, it no longer fit with astrology yeah. because people could see that astrology was not scientific. So <laughs> they didn't, you know, so it was like, There was a split there, but of course, astrology continued on Mm -hmm. and it was very fatalistic. Uh, And then there was a big change in the late 1800s, early 20th century uh, with the advent of psychology. And psychology was, for whatever reason, uh, there was astrologers who took some of the ideas of psychology, which was a new field and which I guess a lot of people found fascinating, and they merged it with astrology. So when they started interpreting somebody's birth chart, they weren't giving it the normal fatalistic interpretations. They were adding these psychological dimensions to it. Mm -hmm. And that was really kind of the birth of contemporary astrology, the way it's done today, uh, because astrology today but for being done by most astrologers is almost like a therapy session Mm. and so you're there with the astrologer who's telling you something like you know i see from your chart you're attracted to um unstable men uh and uh you know your marriages um, may not last or probably don't last um, or it's very difficult to make them last because the you're attracted to these unstable partners, et cetera. You know, or I see this influence from your childhood where your mother was very distant. And so there are these psychological factors that get put in. And part of that, a lot of that comes just from the field of psychology in general, but um, especially from Carl Jung. So Jung had a huge influence 
on modern astrology. A lot of astrologers, when I was an astrologer, a lot of astrologers whose books I read were Jungian psychotherapists. And they were Jungians, and they also knew astrology, because Jung, Carl Jung, who I guess I guess most people listening to this are going to know who he is. I don't know if yeah. you want to say more about him, but you know he was a a psychologist who had studied with Freud, and they um, they had a conflict, and Jung left Freud and started his own practice and became quite well known. And for a while, he was you know kind of famous and and popular. But he had all of these very kind of, uh, I think, kind of strange ideas about things. And he came up with ideas that were actually spiritual, um, more than psychological, like the collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. This is, And the collective unconscious plays a huge part hmm. in modern astrology. Yeah. Because the outer planets that I mentioned earlier, Uranus was discovered during the um, Industrial Revolution. And then Neptune was discovered in the 1800s around the time... Uh, film um, was discovered and, 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 and developed, and then Pluto uh, was discovered in 1930, which was around the time of nuclear, nuclear power. Hmm. So each of those planets are connected to those things. So Uranus is a planet of invention and revolution and innovation. Neptune is a planet that rule, rules film and imagination and deception. And Pluto is a is a planet that rules death and um, power, uh, secret power, hidden power, that kind of thing. So they're all connected to the times they were discovered, and they were added to the chart. And since they move so slowly in a person's chart, um, they they are also they aren't looked at as personal planets so much as they are planets of the collective unconscious. So mm. they. They rule entire generations. Uh, so you might say, here's this whole generation. They were born with Neptune, you know, in Aries or whatever. Mm. Um, or this generation was born with Pluto in uh, Libra, et cetera. And so you've got this kind of broader aspect to astrology. You can look at them personally if they're affecting a personal planet, like if you're sun in your chart is opposite Neptune or something, then there is definitely going to be an interpretation of that. Yeah. It's just for you. But these planets were tied to the collective unconscious, and this all came from, from Jung. So actually, a lot of astrologers, including myself, when I was one, had this kind of Jungian worldview when we were doing charts for people. And th this included the concept called the shadow side. Okay, this is, comes from Carl Jung. Um, he, uh, another concept that comes from him that's in the new age is called synchronicity. Mm -hmm. uh, that comes from Carl Jung. The anima and animus come from Carl Jung. And these, these are all part of, uh, not all astrologers necessarily are using these union concepts, but I can tell you that when I was an astrologer, it was very widespread mm -hmm. and that a lot of us did you know, we didn't consider ourselves Jungian psychologists unless we actually were one, but we we just we just we just kind of absorbed some of that Jungian worldview and used it in our chart interpretations. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I had a whole book on the planet Saturn and how to interpret just the planet Saturn in the chart, written by a Jungian um, psychologist. Yeah, and yeah. you know that so that kind of, that's you know what I'm trying to do is show you that. Astrology developed. I just want to say this real quick, and then, because I, I heard Walter Martin say on that clip, you know, it's the occult influence of the, of the stars and planets on people. And actually, modern astrologers don't really see it that way. They see um, astrology as a pattern, and you are born at a certain time and place, so that such that the planets and the sun and moon will be in a certain position that will reflect your your path that's sort of the blueprint for your life. Yeah, that's uh I, that's really that's really intriguing and fascinating and it's always good to hear different vantage points. One thing I want to bring out because we're going to go into defining terms and cuz you did mention mm -hmm. that uh it went to it really the modern astrology the emphasis was on psychology uh 
and it, when and so that was a they mentioned that at least in Walter Martin's book, they mentioned in the 1930s it became the that's when horoscopes became popular. But then it talked about too how in many ways it even became it got continually redefined uh, into the New Age movement uh, during the 1970s. And there's there's some clips that we'll play uh, in the second episode that kind of talk about when that became an aspect of astrology. But one of the things I want to, I want to bring up before we end this, before we end, uh, we'll maybe spend 10 minutes or so talking about this is you were talking earlier about how astronomy came from astrology. And I think I, what I want to just emphasize real quick is that a lot of times people will look at that and say, well, can the new age be redeemed? Can the New Age, can the occult be redeemed? Because in many ways you had astronomy, the foundations of it came from people who ultimately had a biblical worldview and, and saw God as the creator of all things, not looking for some secret esoteric knowledge. Mm. But in many ways, I've seen some people would look at something like that in order to justify additional practices. I mean, and that's why a lot of times there'll be, pract- there'll be a lot of things that are related to the, the discernment realm sometimes comes to our in sort of our area of discussion just because you have aspects within evangelicalism of people trying to redeem different aspects of the new age but i have seen that argument used in passing in order to justify that saying oh, yeah. saying that yeah, can, can you can you speak to that real quickly because i think it's yeah, very very and, important yes yes and i and i don't think i said astronomy came from astrology i said astronomy split I said astronomy and astrology split. Okay. Because I'm very careful because I'm very aware of that concept out there because I've had to confront it many times in my ministry. Um, I've had people say, well, you know, chemistry came from alchemy, Mm -hmm. you know, and astrology came from uh, astronomy came from astrology. So, you know, there must be some truth in astrology. There must be some truth in alchemy. And it's, it's just, yeah, people discovered some chemical, I guess, truths. Uh, we're doing alchemy, but that doesn't mean they're the same thing. They're very different. And the fact that people started seeing the scientific and understanding the scientific side of, of the planets and the stars, uh, it doesn't mean they had to know astrology to do that. You know, they were just using the raw data. Right. And I would never say that astronomy came from astrology. Personally, I yeah. would never say that. So I think there's there's a real clear distinction, and I think it's wrong when people say, well, astrology gave birth to astronomy. That's not true. What gave birth to astronomy was understanding scientific principles or discovering scientific principles and applying them, you know, looking at the data, and actually what that did was show that astrology was false. So, you know, if anything, astronomy shed light on the falsehood of, ast- of astrology wow. <laughs> and chemistry shed light on the falsehood of alchemy. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, you know, that to me is a better way to, to look at it because I'm, I'm real familiar with that argument. And people right. will use that to support uh, occult practices or say that there's some kind of truth or something in them. We can still look at them and, you know, discover some kind of truth in them. And that's just not true. They just, they didn't really, you know, maybe they used some data that was true, but that had to be taken out and separated from the false kind of thinking that was involved there. And that had to, a distinction had to be made. So they're not, it's astronomy doesn't exist because of astrology. Right. Gotcha. So in other words, in passing, Andrew, you have something you want to jump in as we wrap up here, but in other words, it would be that they would, they would split. And the reason for the splitting wasn't that they're like, Oh, let me see what we can find in astronomy and in astrology to redeem it and Christianize it. It was, it was more about, no, let's look to the word of God. Let's, let's look at the biblical worldview, what, what God says about the world and the universe and both, the physical realm and the in relation to the unseen realm and all the different aspects of it. And let's look at that. Let, not that they're trying to go into this pagan practice to redeem it, but in fact, it's more of a, a rejection of that pagan practice mm-hmm. by looking at all the different physical elements, you know, even in chemistry, look at all the different table of the elements, all those things got spoken to existence. Let's have a framework in which we have an ultimate point of reference to that. Um, yeah, that, that makes more sense. So what, what, Andrew, what'd you have yeah, to say before we wrap up? Kind of what I was thinking piggybacks off of exactly what you were saying, Jerry, it's kind of like they brought it back. The split brought it back to the Genesis one fourteen. God determines the meaning 
of stars. And this is what God says. It says, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to distinguish between the day and the night. Let them be signs to mark the seasons in days and years. So regular astronomy, looking at mathematics and looking at the stars, totally cool. It's something that God gives us to mark certain things, not to try to find a meaning, meaning in a deterministic nature to how people act and why they act the way they act. That's called divination. Um, right. Astronomy is more actually in line with Genesis 114. Astrology is in line with di divination and condemned in Deuteronomy 18, in a sense. Right. Good. Right. Well, any, any last, any last uh, things you want to say before we wrap up the uh, the first episode here, Marcia? Um, no, I, I have a few things that I've thought of for the second part. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, uh, if, if you want to touch on those, because they're things that I have come across in my ministry that are related to astrology that I get asked by, by some Christians. So. Yeah, that'll, that'll be good. We'll bring up some of the questions. Sometimes people have objections, okay. you know, can you do with it? But we'll also what we'll do is we're going to go a little further. And now that we've laid really a historical foundation of where it came from and also to ultimately what God says about it. Uh, we're going to explore that further, but also we're going to get into defining terms because now these, this is the lingo that you're going to hear as you go about your daily life, whether you're in uh, personal, whether you look at something in relation to personal development, uh, health and wellness, all the different things, every aspect of life, it's everywhere. You can't escape it. So we're going to talk about that understand what the terms mean. How do we look at that from a biblical worldview? And that'll be a lot of fun. So, uh, Marcia, thank you for coming on and having this very eye-opening discussion. Uh, and I'm, I'm super excited to jump into uh, the next episode about that. So if you guys enjoyed this episode, please share this episode uh, wherever you can. Uh, tell your friends about it and and yeah, we just appreciate you so much for uh, supporting us and for listening to our content every single week. And as always, this program cannot continue without your support. So if you let, if you feel led to support the ministry, please go to thecultishshow.com. You can donate one time or you can become a monthly recurring supporter. And aside from that, we'll talk to you guys next time on Cultish in part two of the world of astrology as we talk with Marcia Montenegro. Talk to you guys soon.